Hunt is our uh, guest for today. We are so excited and lucky to have him. Um, Hunt is an economist, a behavioral economist, um, who's at Microsoft Research and also visiting at Harvard, who spent many years before that at um, NYU as a professor of economics. He does all sorts of fascinating work. The, the thing I know him for best probably is some of his research with OPower on um, social norms and their power to change our power consumption. Uh, so really excited to hear about some of his newer work that he's going to be presenting today related to technology and addiction, which is unfortunately personally quite relevant. So I'm going to turn it over to Hunt. Hunt, thank you for being with us and really excited to hear what you have to say today. Uh, fantastic. Well, thanks again for having me. Um, this, is, this is great fun and you guys have started a, a great institution here with this seminar series. Um, this is joint work with Matt Jensko uh, from Stanford and Lena Song, who's one of our excellent PhD students um, at NYU. And the jumping off point for us is that, you know, in the last 20 years, there's been a dramatic change in the way that people around the world communicate and get information and just spend our time. So in the U.S., there's some data suggesting that people spend an hour of three, uh, an average of three hours per day on their smartphones. There are 3.8 billion social media users worldwide. And a natural conclusion that you might come to on the basis of you know, all this, this usage is that consumers are getting vast benefits um, from these products and services. Now, there's another story uh, that I think a lot of people are talking about. Uh, which is the story about ad addiction. So the reason that we're using these products so much is not that we're getting lots of value from them, but instead that we're addicted. And so we've, we've got a, a slide here with a number of books that have been written, including by my former colleague, uh, Adam Alter at NYU, in the bottom left on addictive technology um, and a number of other um, arguments that social media and our smartphones and other digital technologies are designed to capture our attention in a way that is actually harmful to us and that we all should go through digital detoxes. We should break up with our phones, uh, et cetera. And I think, you know, the, the reason there's so much discussion around this is that I think it, it broadly resonates with how many people out in the world uh, report or feel about their own behavior. And just as a introductory documentation of that, um, we did just a simple survey where we gave people a list of activities, which you see on the on the X axis of this figure. And we said, listen, there's some things that we do that we feel like we do too much. Other things we feel like we don't do enough of and many other things where we're happy with uh, our behavior. Uh, for each of these behaviors, tell us whether you think you do it too much, too little or the right amount. And we've organized these, as you can see, from left to right in order from most tempting to least tempting within the set of questions we asked. And notice, let's look at the, the top five on the left. Three of these are activities that uh, behavioral scientists are really used to thinking about and researching. Exercise, saving for retirement, eating unhealthy foods. We know that there is, um, uh, that people perceive temptation problems in those domains. What I think is interesting here is that two of the top five, which I've put in bold, are the activities we're going to study today, browsing social media and using smartphones. Um, and I think um, that this figure highlights th the need for additional uh, research in, in this space. And so just to put a complete fine point on why this matters, I think there are a series of questions that this discussion brings up that we can all contribute to, to answering. One is, uh, should users and parents uh, limit uh, our time and our kids' time on digital devices? What are the best ways, behaviorally informed ways, to design digital self-control tools? So should socially responsible investors uh, invest in companies like Apple, Facebook, Google, and my own employer, Microsoft, that have gaming, social media, uh, smartphone divisions? Or should we think of these companies more like cigarette companies or prescription opioid makers uh, in, ter in terms of predicting addict uh, producing addictive goods? Should product designers and engineers work on these products and should they be more mindful of user well-being? And is there a role uh, finally for uh, regulations such as some that have uh, been proposed recently? So with that broad introduction, here's, here's what we do in the paper. Uh, we're gonna start off with a psychologically informed economic model 
of digital addiction. And then uh, we carry out a field experiment uh, with smartphone users in the US. Uh, and then finally, we have a, what economists call a structural model that will allow us to quantify the effects of digital addiction as we're about to define it on time use and uh, consumer surplus. So that's the setup of the paper. I just want to give you a, a sketch of the model without doing the math, you know, in a, in a, in a lunchtime presentation like this. Um, the beginning of the model is um, what economists call rational or, or forward looking habit formation that originates in a, a paper by Becker and Murphy in 1988. And that's just that using more now increases my marginal utility of future use and thus increases uh, my, my future consumption. Now, we're going to add some additional features on top of the Becker and Murphy Foundation. First, we're going to add projection bias uh, using the framework of Lowenstein, O'Donohue, and Rabin, 2003. And projection bias is just, uh, I don't pay attention to how habit formation could happen. I don't pay attention when I'm actually choosing my usage in the moment to how my current use will affect uh, my future use. The, the, addition, the next feature we're going to add is uh, temptation. Um, we're actually going to use the Banerjee and Mullinoff 2010 temptation good framework, which has many of the same predictions as uh, beta delta or other um, models of time and consistency. And it's just going to be uh, that I use my smartphone now more than I would like myself to use in the future. Uh, and finally, we're going to have a dis possible distinction between perceived temptation and actual temptation. People might be sophisticated, uh, in which case they would want to limit their future use. They want commitment devices. Or they could be naive, um, in which case they would underestimate their future use. And the key thing I, I want you to notice is that in each of these sub-bullets, I have listed in hopefully intuitive terms um, uh, testable hypotheses that we are then going to uh, test with our experiment. Now, I, I'm not going to walk through the math, but I just want to give you a sense of, of what this looks like. There is a utility function using, using Greek letters. And what we do in our quote unquote structural model is that we're going to use, um, we're going to estimate the Greek letters that you see on this screen and that I won't show you in the, uh, from the next uh, couple of slides. Um, and so this is what I mean by a structural model. We're actually going to estimate parameters of the utility function, and we're going to do that using the first order conditions, or in particular, the Euler equations uh, that come out of this model. Let me tell you about the experimental design. So we recruit about 2,000 uh, Android users who are adults. Uh, in the US using Facebook ads that look like the ones that you see here below. And we asked them to install a custom app that uh, we had developed uh, for our study uh, that, that we call Phone Dashboard. Um, Phone Dashboard's base functionality that everybody has uh, is a screen that looks like this that just reports uh, how much you've been using uh, your different apps on your phone. Uh, over the last, uh, over today and over the last week, people actually don't use this particular screen much in the control group. Uh, but the key is that we're going to be able to observe these data, of course, with the user's consent. We will have for everyone in our study um, uh, their uh, usage of app actually, uh, of each app actually at five second intervals, so very granular data. Um, here's the first half of the experiment. We recruited people in March and April of this year. Um, and then they come into a survey, a first survey on April 12th um, that begins our baseline period, and then a second survey on May 3rd. And it's on that second survey that people uh, in the treatment group start to be treated differently. And we have two different interventions. A first row, you can see there's something called a bonus, and a second row uh, that has limits and different variations of the limits. These are uh, factorialized against each other. And let me tell you what these interventions actually are. First, for the interventions uh, and our analysis, we're gonna focus on a set of six apps, which we call FITSB. It was the best acronym we can think of for these six letters, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, browsers, and YouTube. Browsers are in here because if I 
incent you in the ways I will describe to use uh, one of these apps less, the first thing that you would do is open up that app on your uh, web browser. And so we wanted to make sure that that, that um, immediate margin of substitution was not available to people. So here's the first treatment. It's called the screen time bonus. And uh, we message it to people as follows. If you're selected for the screen time bonus, you'll receive $50 for every hour you reduce your screen time below some benchmark. Um, that benchmark is based on people's baseline usage. So just think of this as a $50 per hour subsidy for reduced usage, where per hour, I mean per average hour over a three-week period. So if I reduce my usage over a three-week period from uh, my three-hour benchmark to two hours, I'm going to earn $50. Now, this bonus uh, and whether, you're not, whether or not you're going to receive it is announced on what we call Survey 2, which is on May 3rd. But the bonus incentive period is in effect uh, in what we call period three, which is uh, May 25th through June 13th, so three weeks after the announcement. And uh, you can start to anticipate what we will do with people's anticipatory uh, behavior. The second key treatment is the screen is the uh, limits. So for 60% of people, we turn on a functionality that allows them to set daily usage limits on the apps on their phone. So this uh, person here is setting a limit of one minute per day on Facebook. We also build in the ability to snooze this limit, by which I mean um, I can give myself additional minutes today, but only starting X minutes in the future. And we randomize X between zero minutes, two minutes, five, 20, and never. And this randomization allows us to give flexibility within this commitment device and also to say something about this discussion about uh, how long is now or when is the future? And is it enough to delay consumption two minutes into the future or just zero? Do I have to just uh, have a small barrier of just clicking, uh, you know, with zero minutes or do I need to fully eliminate flexibility for this, for this type of commitment device to be, um, to have any uh, effect? But when I set this daily usage limit here, that's going to be effective tomorrow, and I can change tomorrow's limit to anything else uh, using this part of the functionality. But once the day has arrived, all I can do is, is snooze that limit, giving myself more time, but only starting later that day. Okay. Thus, this is the full experimental design I already showed to the top half, and we have two follow-up surveys. Um, after randomization. And so we have then on surveys one, three, and four, uh, we're measuring outcome variables. And then also on surveys two through four, we'll have people predict their future use. In addition, on survey two, we ask people to tell us their valuation of this uh, screen time bonus that I showed you. And on survey three, we ask people, we elicit people's valuation of the limit functionality. We use uh, those, those multiple price list valuations or MPL valuations as uh, separate measures uh, of temptation that I won't have time to talk about today. Um, <clears throat> let me jump into the results. And I'm going to skip a number of things. If you'd like to see all this uh, you're welcome to invite any of the three of us to give a seminar at your local institution. Uh, here's our first key result, and it's on habit formation. What I'm plotting here is the effect of uh, the screen time bonus on Fitzby use. The y-axis is negative. This is an incentive to reduce your usage, and so the treatment effect is negative. And um, these four spikes are the treatment effects in the four uh, different periods of our experiment. Now, remember the bonus is announced at the beginning of period two, but the incentive is for reductions in period three. In period two, the leftmost spike here in red, you see a small and, and marginally significant with 95% confidence anticipatory response. Now, in our model, that's going to get interpreted as projection bias. And the reason is that in the context of our model, people in period two are going to look forward into period three and say, well, I, I'm going to want to reduce my usage in period three to make more money from this bonus. 
And so in order to make that easier on myself next period, I'm going to reduce usage now and, and thus reduce my future marginal utility. Um, our model predicts that that anticipatory reduction in period two should be about 20 minutes per day, but we only see, what is that red spike? It's about five minutes per day. And so the failure to anticipate your habit formation or, uh, by not, uh, not sufficiently reducing your usage in period two is going to get attributed to projection bias. People in our model are inattentive to the habit formation that they would otherwise like, otherwise like to form coming into period three. For those of you who are in the cigarette smoking literature, this is related to these tests of whether people stop smoking in advance of a known future cigarette price increase. Now moving to period three, this is the second spike. We see a reduction of 55 minutes per day in response to this $50 per average hour subsidy. Uh, so that just says demand is elastic. And then the rightmost spikes in periods four and five, this is after the incentive is over. And so this is habit formation. And you can see if there was no habit formation, those rightmost two spikes would be right at zero, but people indeed have formed habits, uh, but they, they decay away as you can see in periods four and five. Let's talk about temptation. So uh, we have three approaches um, to measuring temptation. And I'm just gonna focus on uh, the first one, which is how people use that time limiting functionality. So I'm gonna repeat the figure I just showed you, except I'm gonna add four more spikes on the right hand side. And these are the treatment effects of the limit in uh, periods two through five. Uh, so this, this is, uh, so you can see that this effect size uh, is fairly constant as the case slightly over the 12 weeks of our experiment, but it's between 20 and 25 minutes per day. And so this is people telling us through their use of this commitment device that they feel that they use their smartphones too much, or in particular, they feel like they use particular apps on their smartphones too much. They want to reduce their usage and the commitment device uh, in our phone dashboard app is successful at helping people do so. Um, let's move on to talk about, we can, we can look at this just to say we can look at this by app. So this is the treatment effects of the bonus in red and the limit in gray uh, by app. And so most of the reduction is coming from Facebook. You can see it to the left, followed by browsers, YouTube, Instagram, Snapchat, and Twitter. We can also look at the impacts on other apps on your phone. So this is substitution away from these six uh, apps. The bonus is an incentive to use Fitzby less. We see a slight but not statistically significant increase on the far right in use of other apps on your phone. The limits, we, we, we focus the limit setting instructions on Fitzby. People do set limits on their other apps, but you can see on net, the rightmost gray spike is saying that people are net substituting away from these apps. And so I think this is an interesting example of how you give people a commitment device to use uh, and sort of encourage the functionality to use a certain set of uh, tempting um, goods less. And the first thing people do is they try to get around that. They try to get around their own use of the commitment device by substituting to other apps. So I think that's an interesting comment on the dynamics of this. Let's talk about naivete. So we're going to measure naivete, as I hinted earlier, by comparing people's actual usage to their predicted usage. Um, we're going to focus on the control group for this figure. Um, and I'm plotting average usage or predicted usage on the Y axis here. Now within each period, there are multiple spikes. The leftmost spike, which is in red, is actual usage in that period. And so you can see that actual usage in the control group across these periods is between 135 and 142 minutes per day. And this is usage of Fitzby apps. Now, the spikes to the right of the red spike within each period are predictions of usage for that period elicited in an incentivized way on our surveys. And what do you notice? All of the spikes are below the corresponding red spike for that figure. So people are systematically and repeatedly underestimating their future usage, although not by much, by you know five to 10 minutes. 
And this is in a context where we are, as we elicit usage, telling people their previous usage to ground them in the right units, and they still continue to think that they're going to reduce in the future, but they don't. So that in our model is going to be evidence of naivete. Um, <clears throat> there's one other point to make about these predictions. People do correctly predict the habit formation that is observed. And I think that's an important commentary on what projection bias is. So at least in this context, people are intellectually aware that when you incentivize them to reduce their usage, that will have an additional long-term effect um, in periods four and five after the screen time bonus ends. So people know that habit formation will happen, but as I discussed a few slides ago, when people actually choose um, their usage, they are choosing in our model as if they're inattentive uh, to the habit formation that will happen. And so that suggests that projection bias in our context may be more about inattention than biased beliefs. Let me, uh, let me sort of just tell you at the end what we can do with these models. What we want to do is estimate the effects of temptation and naivete using the model-free experimental moments that I showed you. We want to estimate the impacts of temptation and naivete on time use and on consumer surplus. So if the, in this figure I'm showing you two demand curves, the, the rightmost demand curve in blue is actual demand, and the green demand curve, which is shifted in, is our model's prediction of counterfactual demand without temptation or naivete. And so the statistics I wanna report here are the time use effect, just the, the difference in time use between these two demand curves, and also uh, the yellow shaded triangle, which is the impact on consumer surplus of quote unquote overconsumption from the perspective of the long run self from temptation and naivete. And so we have a figure that uh, will allow us to do this. In the interest of time, I'm gonna skip over it. I'll just show you one uh, particular th set of things that we can do. This is, uh, per this is effects on Fitzby use, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, et cetera of the different parameters in our model. And I want to focus here on temptation, for example. If we take, take people's temptation that is revealed um, through, the exper through the experiment and we zero that out, we predict that people would use Fitzby uh, in this simulation about 40 minutes less uh, per day. So a material reduction in usage. If we eliminate naivete, there's not, uh, naivete that we observed was not severe. Putting, putting that in a habit formation framework, um, we predict that naivete increases usage only slightly, you see in the second spike. So let me conclude. Um, uh, we have in the paper, and I skipped over it today, but we have qualitative evidence uh, consistent with the first slide, but additional evidence there that uh, many people want to reduce uh, smartphone social media use, and they report on survey scales of addiction, uh, sort of moderate amount of addiction. But we wanna go beyond these survey scales. And so to do that, we developed the experiment that I showed you and we see experimental evidence of habit formation, projection bias, temptation, and minor amounts of naivete. Using our structural estimates, we show that temptation and naivete increase usage by, um, depending on the simulation, 20 to 40 minutes per day. And we can put a dollar number on that using our model. And in the current estimates, it's about $50 um, per person per year. And so I think, the takeaways in, in the big picture that I have from this are that social media and smartphone use involve self-control problems, just like exercise, saving money, and healthy eating. And there's much more work to do to sort of uh, take the thinking that people in this uh, group have done in those domains and apply the lessons and think about design implications and policy implications in this space of digital addiction. So thanks very much, and I'm looking forward to the conversation. Hunt, on behalf of the um, hundreds of people who are watching, like, thank you so much. I, I want to start with some clarifying questions from um, from Don Moore, for example. Um, just that first figure where you surveyed people about what they do too much or too little or, or just right. Uh, is the zero just right? And is I think it's absolute value, right? Like you could either be doing this thing too much or too little, right? Like people are not saying that they are saving too much for retirement. But, but they are probably saying they're not exercising enough. So it's just deviations from optimal, is that right? 
Yeah. So what's happening here? Sorry, I muted myself. What What's happening here is uh, if you answer the right amount, your score is zero. If you answer too much, your score is one. If you answer too little, your score is minus one. And we're taking the average of those things and then taking the absolute value of that thing. And so basically, and the absolute value. I think the key we, is that you're taking the absolute value, right? So, so, exactly. So it's exactly. basically so these are people, the higher you are, the more you're deviating from what you want. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Really good. Um, Katie asked the question, uh, how do these treatments affect happiness? Like, are uh, people happier when you, you yeah. Yeah, so we have uh, treatment effects on um, survey outcomes. And most of our survey outcomes actually focus on things that are closely proximate to these treatments, like how you score on a phone addiction, uh, you know, how, what you report in terms of whether you feel like you over your, overuse your phone on survey scales that we adapted from the, um, from the literature, a Facebook overuse scale and a smartphone addiction scale. Um, so you see positive in this figure, we've normalized everything in, into standard deviation units. And you see on these sort of proximate addiction scale outcomes that these treatments are reducing the amount that people say they're addicted to their phones, which is exactly what you would expect. Now, if you look uh, further down, you see subjective well-being. This is a battery of seven subjective well-being questions, including happiness, life satisfaction, depression, and then a couple of other things that are like ability to concentrate um, that are sort of in the space between traditional subjective well-being and like focusing. Um, and you see that there are marginally significant to significant impacts on the, on the order of you know, 0 0.05 to 0 0.08 standard deviations on that subjective well-being construction. So kind of is I think the answer like, yes, <laughs> kind sort of, of. <laughs> sort of, kind of, okay. I will say, I will say we have done, um, we have another study that this builds on where we paid a bunch of people to deactivate Facebook before the 2018 election. In that study, um, the subjective well-being impacts on traditional subjective well-being measures, happiness, life satisfaction, depression, are, um, are statistically larger than the treatment effects that we see here. And that could be because we paid people to go cold turkey in 2018. It could be because, be because 2018, our period there was the four weeks before the election. And so that makes people particularly depressed to be on Facebook. Um, this is also not just Facebook, but I, I, it's interesting to know that these are, this is a different result than we got in 2018. Actually, and Hunt, did you mention whether you did this experiment during the pandemic or is this data from last year? No, this is 2020. Uh, this is hot off the presses. Yeah. Um, and so we asked a series of questions to try to understand how our results might be the same or different compared to, if, you know, if we had, had waited another year or two to get this done. Um, and people ha say they have more free time and they say they're using their phones more than they did in 2019. However, um, we also asked people sort of dis our descriptive questions around basically how addicted they feel to their phones. And those questions actually are quite similar. So there's more usage, but it's not clear that, that the pandemic and the lockdowns were sort of leading people to have addicted. exacerbated. Yeah, exactly. Um, Phil Oriopoulos uh, asks, uh, what if they use Facebook or I guess these other five um, things like on their computer? Yeah, so we have, um, this is only, uh, this is only smartphone based. And so a natural margin of substitution would be to your computer or your iPad. Um, and we have self reports of that. And the self reports suggest a moderate substitution in units of time, but actually um, it, the self-reports suggest that, um, you know, if you're getting, for example, 55 minutes per day back in period three from the bonus, that only a small share of those 55 minutes is translated into increases in usage of Fitsby on other apps. So it seems like people are doing something else uh, with their time. In our 2018 study, it was 
people self-reported that they were watching TV more and that they were spending more time with, in person with their friends and family. Uh, Lyle Unger asks, how can 20 minutes a day only yield $50 a year? Um, it's just assuming that that seems small. Yeah, it's, let, so let me show you a figure that I think clarifies this. So 20 minutes a day is the time use effect. So that's the, the uh, horizontal thing in brackets here. $50 a year is the triangle here in yellow. And so to go from the uh, base of the triangle to the area of the triangle, you need to know the slope of demand, of course. And demand is really elastic. So we pay, we pay people $50 per average hour over a three-week period. So that's 20, um, uh, 20 days uh, precisely. And so that's $2.50 per hour of reduction, per actual hour of reduction. And we get a reduction of a total of uh, 55 minutes per day. So there's actually quite a bit of elasticity built into that. It says that people don't really care about those marginal minutes of smartphone use. And that elasticity uh, means that the um, distortion of time use doesn't translate into a large uh, consumer surplus effect. Um, I, actually, Susanna Burkauer's question is um, similar to John Bogard's and then also to mine, which is um, you had said about anticipatory decreases, um, like, you know, knowing that there's going to be bonus and then I guess like gearing up, like training for an upcoming marathon, but you can imagine it going the opposite way, like Mardi Gras before Lent. So um, do you want to comment on how that, I mean, obviously you have your observed data, but. Yeah, so um, there are there are I think two statements to make. One is just the factual statement here that in practice we see a you know slight anticipatory reduction in period two. So as you said, um, Angela, that's that's sort of the treatment effect. Then I think the question that people are raising is, well, how do you interpret that? Um, in our model the only intertemporal um, relationship is through habit formation. We have no other source of intertemporal complementarity or substitutability. So there's no like Mardi Gras kind of effect in our model now. And so that's why in my interpretation, this is loading onto um, uh, projection bias. Um, why might it be that our model should work in this way. Um, I think so, so far, this is just the set of assumptions we've been making. But I think when I think about if you told me, hey, you're going to have to stop using your phone in three weeks, would I binge on my phone now? I don't think so. Like it doesn't strike like our basically our intuition had been that there's not a lot of reason to expect that to, that type of Mardi Gras, I'm going to go nuts now and sort of satisfy myself for the next month. Um, but I think these, these, these questions are good and I don't have anything more than a hand wavy reason to, to not have that in the model. Once we add those things into the model, then uh, this effect that you see here uh, in period two and the period four and five effects could be explained by a broader set of intertemporal complementarities or substitutabilities other than habit formation. Uh, apologize if I get your name uh, phonetically wrong, but uh, Ina uh, Hart from GMU um, asks, do you have data about patterns over time? You know, for example, within, within a day, um, is it possible that people like run out of time early or do they bank it, do they save it? Um, you know, is, is, the, is the time use pattern what you're seeing like fewer minutes per use or some other kind of clustering? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I don't know if I have these results as handy as I would like to have them. In fact, I don't, sorry. Um, the, I don't know about the length of usage spells. So there's an interesting point here, which is that, you know, 
this the the type of consumption that we you that we have on our smartphones is like four minutes here and a half a minute here and 12 minutes here and five seconds there and we haven't looked at how the length of those spells differs and i think that's an interesting thing to explore um in terms of just on average when in the day the treatment effects come the treatment effects are are broadly proportional to the um to control groups usage. So the control group doesn't use much at night. There's not a lot of reduction at night. The control group is using a lot during the evening hours, you know, 5 p.m. to 10 p.m. Most of the reductions happen in the evening hours. Some of the coefficients suggest that as you get later in the day, the limit effects are a little bit larger, which is consistent with people at 10 a.m. not thinking about their limits and then at you know, 10 p.m., like running up in their limit and just stopping. There's a little bit of that, um, but actually not as much as I would have expected. It's pretty balanced throughout the day. Eamon Colvin asks, are you aware of any data on optimal social media use? Many people want to reduce how much time they spend on social media, but what target would make most people the happiest? Um, I think this may be related to our discussion last week that suggested that optimal commute length might be not zero, but 16 minutes um, for reasons that you can ask Ashley herself. <laughs> yourself. Yeah, yeah. So super interesting question. The perspective that um, we're taking in this paper is consistent with the, the, the normative approaches I think used throughout, at least throughout behavioral economics, which is that we want to use uh, inspired by Bernheim and Rangel, we want to use um, people's revealed preferences to determine what's optimal for them. After deleting certain suspect uh, choices from what we consider to be welfare relevant, and so there's there's some controversy, of course, as to whether we should think that the long run self or the present self's desires are normatively valid, but. All we're doing here when we're saying that something is optimal is to say that, well, when we give people the limit functionality, that people are using it. And so that is a revealed preference measure that, um, that what is optimal for them is less than what they're using um, in the absence of this commitment device that we're giving them. And so, you know, the interpretation of our model is that people's usage uh, with the commitment device and through a couple of other um, revealed preference techniques that I didn't have time to go to today, um, that's revealing what is optimal for that individual. Nirajana Mishra asks, um, was there any attrition between the waves of recruitment of the participants? And I assume selective attrition in particular, but yeah, comment so, on that. So great question. We see, let, let me just show you, uh, the hard data on that. So this is our funnel from beginning to end in terms of sample sizes. There are three numbers in bold here. Uh, the first number at top, the 3 million number, that's the number of people that were shown our recruitment ads on Facebook. We get about a 0.8% click through rate, which is totally, st which is exactly standard actually in terms of social media ads, uh, online ads in general, actually. Um, and then from there, pe some people refuse, some people attrit after survey one. And we get down to uh, about 2,000 people who were randomized into the treatment groups. Um, from there, so that's the middle bold number. So the, the first half of the answer is there's a large amount of attrition that happens before randomization, including uh, a survey one, this baseline survey, which we intentionally threw in three weeks before randomization actually happened because we're, we know that people are going to attrit and we want that attrition to happen early. We also, um, in the ads that I showed you before, they don't hint at what the subject of the study is. So we're trying to push attrition that might be related to the subject of the study as far down the funnel as possible. So we're doing the best that we can there, uh, but there's a lot of attrition between advertisement and our treatment and control groups. And to be clear, that's going to be true for any online study, including an online panel where, you know, you buy sample from a sample provider, but there's been a ton of selective admission opt-in into that panel. So this reflects that sort of thing that you would see with an online survey 
outside of using a Marispeak from Nork or something like that. Yeah, um, all the PhD students now, who are listening, take note of that. That's well done. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so um, the second half of the answer to the question, though, is once you're in our groups, we go from 2048 to uh, the bottom number, 1933, who complete the entire study, have all the surveys, and have all the, the um, phone dashboard usage data. So that's about a 5% attrition rate. Um, and it is, it is not unbalanced across the, the two groups. And so what we're doing here is we're aware that there's a lot of attrition. We try to work that out before randomization. And then our team including our grad students and undergrads and, and pre-docs worked very hard on customer support to try to keep our um, attrition rates low from that randomized group. And they, I'm proud that they, I'm proud of them that they were successful in that. Um, Hunt, as a testament to how much uh, interest there is in this topic, um, there are many more questions, but we have run out of time. So uh, Katie and I want to say uh, thank you so much. You are um, uh, you are big shoes to follow. Anu Shah will be trying to do that uh, next week with a talk on perceptions of imperfect strangers um, at the same bat time, the same bat place. Uh, so Katie, um, do you want to just like give the, you know, rousing? Yay, that was great. Thank you, Hunt. We really, really appreciate it. It was so lovely to see you. And thank you for laughing at my jokes, sort of. <laughs> it was <laughs> right. really, really interesting. Joke. I try to stay off of Facebook for the next week. <laughs> okay, everybody, Fantastic. stay off your phones Thanks until next me. week. Hunt, thank you. <laughs> Bye, Han. It was wonderful.